Good morning. My name is John Bratton, and I'm joining you today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, where the snow is just beginning to melt, and we're uh, maybe seeing early signs of springs. I uh, would enjoy being in person at Stonyhurst. It looks like a beautiful place I hope to visit someday. Uh, but I'll be sharing on some reflections on, uh, on faith and science, particularly in the area of environmental science, uh, my area of expertise. Uh, and um, let me begin sharing slides at this point. I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and then we'll get into some of the uh, material I'd like to present. So I, I noticed uh, one of the quotes that's being highlighted today refers to, to uh, kingfishers and dragonflies. Uh, and so responding to the question, what I find fascinating about nature and, and the environment, uh, as, a, as a person of faith, a practicing Roman Catholic, I, uh, you know, I see the, the beauty of creation. It, it, uh, it inspires me. It draws me to, uh, to think more deeply about the creator. And, and to reflect on my role in creation uh, as a created being, uh, particularly on the, on the, the idea of, uh, of these two examples of kingfishers and dragonflies. Um, I'm reminded of the, uh, the Malachite kingfisher, which is found in Africa and Uganda, where my, my wife uh, recently visited. We see an image there on a, on a stamp. Uh, and that combines you know, my interest in biology with my interest in geology. Uh, in the naming there with the, the specimen of malachite here up in the upper right. Uh, and then in terms of dragonflies, um, in the geological past, there were much larger dragonflies under different atmospheric conditions. And in the Carboniferous, we see a, a fossil of one of them here, uh, Meganura. Uh, and on the left, you see uh, uh, the dragonfly to scale. So even with the most impressive dragonflies of today, they're nothing like they used to be. So one, one advantage of being a, a geologist and having some background in paleontology is I get to look into the distant past as well as, uh, as the beauty and the diversity of, of modern uh, organisms as they exist. So one, one scripture that has, um, has struck me over the years as an as a earth scientist and geologist by training is, is from Job. Uh, and when God is responding to uh, to Job's Job's complaints, basically of uh, what has befallen him, uh, he he goes goes through a, um, some of the some of the the mysteries of of the natural world. It's it's quite a interesting passage, probably rivaled only by some of the Psalms. Uh, so in this particular one, uh, I'll read the quote here. He hath stretched forth his hand. To the flint he hath overturned mountains from the roots. In the rocks he hath cut out rivers, and his eye hath seen every precious thing. The depths also of rivers he hath searched, and hidden things he hath brought forth to light. But where is wisdom to be found, and where is the place of understanding? And this this uh, this image shows that you know even as we advance science and technology, uh, in this case with a mining analogy, uh, we unlock the treasures of the earth. We see things that were hidden. Uh, but we may not uh, come away with that experience with a with a full understanding of of the creator and uh, maybe be overly impressed with our techno technological advances. So um, I'm going to focus today uh, talking about environmental stewardship uh, on a on a grand scale with uh, the example of large ecosystem restoration in the Great Lakes that's been going on for, for some decades at this point. Uh, but I'll use it also as an analogy to uh, the larger topic of, of restoration in general, restoration of a fallen world, uh, personal restoration in our lives as we uh, drift away from the path we should be on. And I'll, I'll mention here also that uh, this, this presentation was partially prepared with support from Joseph Kuntz, who uh, is a, a, a professor at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. Um, I am a, a practicing professional geologist, environmental scientist with an environmental consulting firm called Limnotech, and I also am adjunct faculty at Wayne State University in uh, Detroit, Michigan in the U.S. So the Great Lakes, uh, if you're not familiar with them, are, are among the largest lakes in the world. Five of them are, are starred here out of, uh, I think this is a collection of the top 20 all assembled together. The, the lakes here are in position uh, in their relative actual positions that I've, I've started with um, kind of flowing from Lake Superior 
up here in the top, down through Huron and Erie and Lake Ontario, out through the St. Lawrence Seaway into the North Atlantic. Uh, Lake Michigan here is entirely contained within the U.S. Uh, and joins up with, with Lake Huron up at the top of, of Michigan. Uh, the lakes are shared by the U.S. and Canada. Uh, but the the lakes were a site of missionary activity in the in the 1600s. Uh, one of the early missionary explorers was Father Jacques Marquette, who was a Jesuit, and uh, he explored Lake Michigan, the Upper Mississippi uh, River Valley, in 1673 to 74, along with a fur trader, uh, Louis Joliet. And this is commemorated by placement of a, of a cross in Chicago uh, in 1907, shown here down at the bottom. So some of the major ecosystem restoration initiatives that are uh, underway in the U.S. are shown here, uh, Great Lakes being up here on the northern border with, with uh, Ontario and Canada. Uh, but several others you may be familiar with, the Everglades down in Florida, Chesapeake Bay, uh, the lower Colorado River Basin, and the California Bay Delta, among others. So in approaching these large systems, uh, it's, it's a complex process. Any type of ecological restoration is complex, but the scale here is particularly challenging. So just uh, introducing the topic, the lakes are, they contain 84% of North America's surface freshwater, 21% uh, of the world's surface freshwater, and 25% of Canadian agricultural production, and 7% of uh, U.S. farm production is found within the, the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, it's home to over 30 million people, which is about 10% of the U.S. population in that basin and 30% of the Canadian. Uh, so quite a collection of natural and, and human resources here. And just to give a sense of the distribution of, of people here, this is a view, a satellite view at night. And you can see where the, uh, the hot spots of light are around the Chicago, Milwaukee area, uh, Detroit, Cleveland, Toledo, and then uh, Canada's largest city here, Toronto on Lake Ontario. No lights in the lakes themselves, although a little spillage here from Chicago, you might say. Uh, so the lakes flow, as I said, from Lake Superior uh, down through the other two over Niagara Falls and then out uh, the St. Lawrence and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, the deepest part of Lake Superior is actually below sea level, uh, as is Lake Ontario. But uh, quite impressive lake system. It's accessible by a series of locks that allow uh, seagoing vessels to, to come up into the lakes. There are eight states or parts of eight states, US states that are uh, within the basin shown here and uh, all of the Canadian side is occupied the, by the province or part of the province of Ontario. Approximately 120 bands of, uh, of native people have occupied the basin historically. Uh, US tribes have four resource treaties in the basin uh, covering particularly uh, fisheries and U.S.-Canada Boundary Waters Treaty and the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement uh, govern the, the binational relationships related to the lakes. Uh, Great Lakes Compact among the states, among other things, includes uh, agreements about uh, diversion of water from the lakes and prohibitions outside of the basin. So the lakes, uh, I'm going to start with kind of describing how they were uh, used and abused in the early development of the region and how investments have been made to, uh, to bring them back to a more natural state more recently. Uh, so one of the first uh, environmental insults to the lakes was the clear-cut logging that took place in the, uh, the late 1800s into the early 1900s. Uh, starting in the northeast or northeastern U.S. and, and uh, eastern maritime provinces of Canada and then continuing uh, to the west and then into the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but as an example here, you can see this chart down the bottom left that shows the, the amount of white pine that was cut in Michigan uh, peaked in about 1890. Uh, and then by 1910, Michigan was actually having to import white pine for, uh, for construction. Uh, because so much had been cut. Along with that, that uh, clear-cut logging uh, was widespread habitat destruction from 
spring log drives as logs were, were piled up, up along the banks of rivers and floated down the streams caused a widespread, widespread destruction of riparian habitat and uh, extirpation or reduction of many of the, of the, the cold water uh, uh, trout species and other, other species that lived in the, the rivers of uh, northern Michigan, northern Wisconsin, Minnesota. Uh, along with the the lumber industry, there was uh, overfishing of the lakes, uh, resulting particularly in the uh, elimination in many, many parts of the lakes of uh, the lake sturgeon, uh, kind of a large iconic fish, and, and many other species either uh, substantially reduced or, or wiped out by overfishing. Uh, and you can see some of the, uh, the data here for uh, the U.S. in black and, the, and Canadian uh, fishery yields. Uh, from some of the lakes over time. So you see a, uh, a large decline uh, in the U.S. in Lake Erie uh, and, and most of the other lakes. Uh, in some cases, uh, an increase in Lake Erie more recently in the Canadian harvests. In that case, it's particularly uh, walleye and yellow perch. Along with uh, overfishing is the introduction of invasive species by a number of different pathways, among them uh, the sea lamprey, which is a, a parasitic uh, lamprey that was introduced to the upper lakes and, and preys upon larger fish, as you can see here. Uh, and then the Dreissenin mussels, the zebra mussel, the quagga mussel, uh, filter feeders that were uh, coming from the Ponto Caspian region introduced by ballast water of ships. Uh, and became established in the uh, early 1990s uh, to the point that they're now widespread through four of the five uh, Great Lakes, all except Lake Superior, which is, is too cold and has uh, the wrong chemistry for them at the moment. These introduced species, these filter feeders, have been very effective at taking uh, phytoplankton out of the water. So the spring bloom that used to occur in the lakes of diatoms, which was the base of the food web, uh, is all but eliminated. In this case, you can see uh, the, the warmer colors are good, uh, colder colors are bad in this case. So this, uh, this phytoplankton is now missing because it's being consumed by these introduced non-native species. Along with this, uh, as farm development has taken place throughout the basin, runoff from the farms is now fueling algal blooms that occur uh, in many parts of the lakes, particularly in western Lake Erie. So here's a, a satellite image showing a, a large toxic algal bloom that uh, occurs in part of this basin uh, in both U.S. and Canadian waters uh, on a consistent basis every summer, uh, starting in July and continuing in some cases into uh, October or even November. Along with that, we have climate change, which is causing warming. Uh, a recent paper here published is showing uh, that warming is happening not only in the surface waters, but in the deep waters of Lake Michigan. Uh, here looking at a, a time series going back uh, into the 1990s. Uh, offshore gas wells and, and pipelines have also been put in place uh, in the Canadian waters of Lake Erie. Uh, there are prohibitions here on <clears throat> uh, drilling for oil, uh, but gas is, has been developed pretty extensively in this basin, uh, and as well as uh, hydrocarbons that are produced in the basin, there are plenty that are transported through the basin uh, by by rail uh, or by pipeline. So in red here, we see uh, pipeline routes uh, with major terminals and refineries of the orange uh, orange symbols, and then the major rail routes, some of which run right along the, uh, the shorelines of the lake are shown in white uh, that have resulted in oil spills over the year, over the years significantly. Um, a major spill in southern Michigan that that almost made it into Lake Michigan, but uh, uh, fouled approximately 30 miles of the Kalamazoo River. Uh, in addition to that, there's a long history of mining, especially in the upper lakes around Lake Superior, which is a geologically different region than, uh, than the rest of the lakes, including large iron mines and copper mines, uh, and even some precious metals that have gone through boom and bust cycles, probably more on the on the boom uh, scale at this point. Uh, along with that has been transportation, especially of that iron ore um, shown in red here, uh, from the upper lakes down to the lower lakes where uh, where steel production has taken place historically for, for many decades, although uh, somewhat in decline at, at present. So some of the famous mills in, um, in the Chicago area uh, around uh, 
Gary and in, Gary, Indiana, Chicago, uh, Cleveland, some of the industrial cities on <clears throat> uh, Lake Erie uh, and into Buffalo. So here's an image from um, uh, 1973 at one of the large U.S. steel mills in Gary, uh, prior to a lot of environmental regulation. So that's the decline. Now we'll uh, we'll talk about the recovery. Didn't want to bring everybody down. So there were a series of rules and regulations put in place uh, in the 1970s uh, through the, the 1990s and into the 2000s in both the U.S. and Canada, both the establishment of agencies like the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, and the Canada Water Act in 1970, U.S. Clean Water Act 1972, et cetera, a number of agreements, uh, and then uh, most recently in 2010, the U.S. Great Lakes Restoration Initiative that has been uh, responsible for uh, large investment in restoration activities, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this program, as I said, began in, in uh, 2010, uh, consists of over 6,500 projects to date, uh, at a total uh, expenditure of 3.8 billion U.S. dollars through 2021. And has five major focus areas, including uh, toxic, uh, toxic chemicals in uh, in sediment and cleanup of those uh, those areas of concern, uh, AOCs. Also, uh, protection against and and reduction of an impacts of invasive species where that can be done. Uh, controlling non-point source pollution, particularly uh, agricultural runoff and nutrients associated with that. Uh, habitat restoration and species restoration investments, and then uh, additional investment in, in research and outreach and education that would form the underpinnings of future restoration efforts. So uh, the particular uh, topic of areas of concern, there were 43 originally listed in the US and Canada. At this point, six have now been delisted because they've been cleaned up and restored and management actions are complete. Uh, <clears throat> at a, num uh, a number of others moving toward cleanup as well with this new investment, particularly from the U.S. side. Uh, in May of, of 2022, uh, one of the uh, larger cleanup areas in Muskegon Lake, uh, adjacent to Lake Michigan, uh, management actions were completed at that lake at a cost of over $100 million. Uh, and here's an example of mining waste cleanup that's taking place along Lake Superior where uh, uh, tailings or stamp sands, in this case, mill waste from uh, from copper production, uh, was dumped into the into the lake and is now being uh, some of it being dredged back up uh, because it's threatening spawning habitat for lake trout. Also, sediment uh, cleanups taking place in urban areas, such as this example here in Detroit. Uh, in addition, the habitat restoration, the example shown here, is restoring spawning habitat for uh, lake sturgeon. Uh, and this was a very successful operation where the sturgeon actually appeared while the construction was taking place. Uh, some of the large cities have been dealing with their stormwater and uh, of late by major engineering projects. This example here from the city of Chicago. Uh, what we can see here is a uh, creation of large uh, underground storage and diversion tunnels, uh, which actually carry water from the city out to a large quarry. And you can see the size of these tunnels here uh, in the lower right, a group of people standing at the mouth of one of them as it enters a quarry. And as you zoom back out to the whole quarry, here's that same tunnel. So really an enormous uh, engineering feat uh, at great expense, which is ultimately designed to uh, reduce the impacts of that urban area on the city of or, uh, reduce the impacts on Lake Michigan of the Chicago area. We also see a decline in, um, in toxins in the fish themselves that uh, in this case is, is uh, highlighting uh, PCBs as an example. So we see a decline across all the lakes, uh, particularly in uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Ontario from much higher levels in the 1970s uh, when PCBs were banned down to um, substantially lower levels today. 
although invasive species have uh, really taken off over the years, we see uh, kind of a flattening out of the curve uh, here in, in the late 80s, early 90s with uh, very few additional introductions since that time. The graph is showing the different pathways by which those introductions have taken place. And you can see a large one here uh, for shipping as uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway was open and, and organisms came in through ballast water and ships. So in addition to control of invasive species, there are efforts underway to restore species that have been lost. Uh, one that was lost from cold water streams in, in Michigan and other parts of the lakes was the Arctic grayling, uh, primarily impacted by logging. So there is an effort underway to, to restore Arctic grayling, bring them back. And these are some of the candidate streams in Michigan where that's uh, that's being investigated. Uh, and another species I mentioned previously is, is lake sturgeon. Uh, up in this area of Duluth, uh, lake sturgeon stocking began in 1983 uh, because of the long time to sexual maturity of, of sturgeon, the first uh, naturally reproduced young, not, not hatchery grown, uh, weren't found in that region until 2011. So long-term multi-decade investment. And now, now a new uh, similar program is happening here in, in Toledo in the Maumee Basin. And this was some work done to uh, <clears throat> to guide the stocking efforts and restoration efforts, looking at the genetic stocks that existed in sturgeon species throughout the basin. Uh, ad additional fishery research is underway to, to uh, study the migration of fish through the lakes uh, by tagging those fish with acoustic uh, telemetry devices that are then picked up by receivers that are scattered throughout the lakes and uh, give a much better uh, idea of where uh, what, what types of habitat fish are using at, at what st life stages and what times of the year, which allows for much better uh, management and regulation and, and uh, decisions about harvest and stocking guidance. Uh, lots of other tools and technologies <clears throat> being applied to Great Lakes research, many of them adapted from oceanographic applications. Uh, these are would be part of a proposed uh, billion dollar investment, binational investment in, in research uh, to better understand the lakes uh, with an idea toward managing them more, more precisely, uh, similar to some of the technology, the technologies I showed in the last few slides. Uh, other tools and technologies would be uh, enabling uh, 12 month out of the year work from research vessels such as this research icebreaker uh, seen here that's uh, deployed in Alaska. Uh, nothing similar exists in the Great Lakes. Uh, and even mixing uh, mixing science with recreation. So in this case, a cruise ship that now comes into the lakes every summer uh, is equipped with a science payload, which allows uh, uh, passengers on the ship to participate in, in uh, scientific activities uh, launched from the stern of the ship. And also the uh, the advent of autonomous vehicles, such as this one, which is uh, designed for fish studies and, and bottom mapping. Uh, there's been, uh, in, in addition to environmental awareness within the, uh, the, the governments of the US and Canada, uh, there's been activity and, and activism by the indigenous communities that exist within the Great Lakes, both in the US and Canada. Uh, one illustration of this is a 2017 indigenous water walk uh, that happened in, in Toronto and uh, uh, included uh, a blessing of the lakes as shown here. In these, uh, many of these tribes, the, the responsibility for care of the water is uh, falls to the women of the tribe. And so that's why this aspect's being highlighted here. Uh, we do have uh, in the Catholic Church, St. Kateri Tekakwitha uh, as a patroness of the environment, along with uh, St. Francis of Assisi as a patron. Uh, she lived in 1656 through 1680 and was canonized in, uh, in 2012, um, lived in the, in the Great Lakes region in the uh, upstate New York area. Uh, and here's a sculpture of, of her at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C.
in 2019, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, issued a report called Two Rivers, a report on Catholic Native American culture and ministry. Uh, and, in, and included in this report and in, in the highlights was an uh, uh, excerpt that I'll read here that says, the church is called to send missionary disciples to the Native American communities to immerse themselves in the culture of the people and to borrow and incorporate elements of the Native American narrative that are in tune with the gospel. Uh, and these would include elements such as the Native American sense of restorative justice, a family-centered spirituality, and a historical environmental reverence. So much to be learned from uh, different cultures that have a different approach to uh, relationship with the environment and environmental stewardship that's recognized by the Catholic bishops. Uh, and similar to the Native American blessing shown previously, this is a, an image uh, from 2019, a blessing of Lake Michigan, in this case by Bishop uh, Mylon Latch, uh, also a Jesuit of the Ruthenian Byzantine Catholic Church. And here he's making the sign of the cross in the water with his wooden hand cross as part of a blessing of Lake Michigan that took place in Indiana uh, in January on 2019. Looks like a, a quite a cold event for that time of year. So the, the lesson, one of the lessons we can take away from thinking about environmental stewardship and environmental restora restoration is uh, kind of a, a large scale, scale parable uh, for, our, for our own lives. And, and we know that uh, that Jesus taught in parables, either short parables as images or, or longer stories, uh, two of them highlighted here. So as, as the lakes have been restored or in the process of being restored, hopefully we'll, we're, we're each of us being restored from a, a fallen state to a, 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 sta a more Christ-like state growing in holiness. Uh, and, and like there's this uh, recovery strategy shown here for the dwarf lake iris, which is uh, threatened or endangered throughout the basin, um, <clears throat> there are strategies proposed for us as well. So um, i highlight two verses here to conclude. One is uh, from Luke, uh, a mini parable where, where Jesus says, consider the lilies, how they grow, they labor, not, neither did they spin, but I say to you, not even Solomon in all his glory was clothed like one of these. Uh, kind of talking about how, how God cares for creation and, and in turn cares for us even more. Uh, and then finally, the famous story of the prodigal son and, and his return and the restoration of his relationship from Luke a little bit later in Luke. Uh, so in this parable, it concludes, uh, or at least the, the restoration part of it concludes with the father saying to the servants, bring forth quickly the first robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and make merry because this my son was dead and has come to life again, was lost and is found. And then they began to be merry. So let us uh, not get too discouraged by the state of uh, environmental systems around us, be encouraged uh, both that we can make a difference if, if there's uh, a commitment to undo some of the wrongs of the past and to, to reduce our impact uh, going forward. Uh, and use that as, as a life lesson to apply to our own lives as well. So thank you for the opportunity to present today. I hope you enjoy the, the rest of the presentations um, and look forward to meeting some of you in person at some point.